I want to welcome the audience for joining us. Uh, today we'll be talking about the success of real-time performance management paired with having a deep understanding of complexity by call driver and by contact channel. When you execute on and you can analyze those two areas, it allows you to move customer experience quickly and successfully. Uh, my name is Wadad Nasuli. I am the Senior Vice President of Customer Success and Business Insights at IBEX. Uh, I would like to introduce and welcome to the conversation Yulia Orlova, who runs Customer Experience at Toast. Hello, Yulia. Hello, Wadad. Nice to see you again. Good to see you, too. So I will give you a sec for introductions. I thought we could start um, just by talking a little through your role, the partnership between IBEX and Toast, uh, the timing of that, which was early 2020, which was in itself just chaos, and how your company supporting the restaurant business really evolved during that time. Yeah, I'm happy to jump in. So again, hi, I'm Yulia. I have been at Toast for several years now, working in a bunch of different roles, but really all around the strategy and experience um, and analytics that have to do with, with how our customers interact with us. Toast is a company that uh, we call ourselves a vertical platform in the restaurant space. So we really want to take over every piece of technology that the restaurant has to deal with and really all the worries that a restaurant manager has to deal with that's not actually cooking the food and giving customers a wonderful, wonderful experience. And that's really changed, obviously, during the pandemic, how we interact with our customers and how our customers interact with their customers. So it's been it's been a really wild ride with uh, guest facing online ordering uh, platform taking the lead. It's it, it was already something we were working on, but uh, our focus definitely changed um, in the last few months. And I think that as any technology company that innovates faster than they expected to knows that there's going to be some hiccups around the way. So kind of understanding the voice of the customer and working with your team at IBEX would add has been incredibly crucial in us being able to iterate quickly and make and make that feedback loop super tight. Yeah, yeah. I think when we first started talking, you know, there were two uh, kind of plans of attack we had. I think the first one was, how do we get really fast gains and insight into what was driving our advisors to struggle, like from a customer experience perspective? What could our agents control and how could we move that quickly? And that was really our performance management process that we launched in kind of that partnership. And then once we kind of hit the gas on that, the second piece was, okay, outside of the agent handling process. What else in your business was possibly complex and what were those drivers that were driving dissatisfaction or repeat contacts, you know, or just a lack of resolution? And we kind of addressed the, the performance management piece first, but I thought we could tackle that fairly quickly. And then the complexity analysis kind of came later. Yeah, with a with a company that is vertically integrated like Toast, it it's not um, a very simple exercise to understand either sides of that equation, right? We deal both with hardware as well as software. We deal with a ton of different uh, types of customers, franchisees to single over owner operated to customers that sell retail, as well as different products. We um, are now in the payroll space, we have online ordering, we have our POS tool. And so it, it gets really difficult to uh, sort out that information, whether it's how our agents interact with our customers or how our product interacts with our customers um, and, and get out the noise out of the way so we can focus right. on what really matters. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, on the performance management piece, really just to ground kind of the audience and, and what that meant for us and how we did that, um, it started with agent understanding of this metric. Why does it matter? You know, do agents have visibility to it? Do they have visibility to it real time? You know, at no point should you ever ask an advisor, do you know where you are performing from a customer satisfaction perspective and you see deer caught in the headlights, right? Like they need to know, they need to know their score, their score against their team, against the program. So I think one piece for us was just awareness to get that out there. And then we trigger just real time coaching and circle back same day whenever we would see a detractor or, or a negative, you know, survey response um, with kind of validation real time. And we saw kind of our team managers own that because at the end of the day, 
you know, they own coaching and developing of their people. And um, so, so they, they owned that process. But then they, there was like a back, there was an engine on the back end feeding them that data. And I think that was important for us because this idea of team managers should be engaged and on the floor and or, or remotely, right? But with their people essentially coaching, you have to give them the data that matters and the data that's going to drive the metric versus, you know, hoping they all figure it out, right? And so I think feeding them the data real time, circling back as well real time on the effectiveness of it. And then what ends up happening is the number moves pretty quickly at an agent level, but then you took those insights and you're able to feed them into your training organization. And, you know, of course, we all know you can't update a knowledge base overnight, right? There's a lot of development, but you're able to do, you know, quick Hi. videos, right, or just like one pager <laughs> that you can push in um, or push out to agents. And, you know, just I know you, you're not very good at tuning your own horn, so I'm going to do it for you. But essentially from 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 Q3 of 2020, where we said we really need to elevate customer experience to Q1 of 2021 that we're still in, just the performance management process drove a 21% increase to your CSAT. It drove a 20% reduction in your AHT. Um, it drove about a 50% reduction of your transfers from tier one to tier two. So not only you know taking ownership of that experience from a tier one perspective, but understanding those unnecessary transfers and first call resolution and your team did that while we were ramping. So we're also adding headcount to, to the program. So, I mean, those numbers are, are honestly, you know, astonishing. I mean, we, when uh, and you mentioned this before, we started uh, the relationship with IBEX in, I think we had the first class starting to ramp in February. And as you probably remember, after February came March and, and everything, the world <laughs> came on. Ahead. And so we really thought that, our, our early relationship would be a lot more hands-on than it, than it turned out to be of getting you guys enabled, ramped, all of that stuff. And so we really had to rethink how we engaged with each other and our partners um, in Nicaragua so we could really uh, kind of speak the same language and monitor the same metrics. And I think that it just took a different muscle and, and we've, we've done a really good job of, of getting there and, and speaking the same language and, and the, the numbers do show it. Um, we also went through, um, unfortunately, a layoff during the beginning of COVID, like a lot of restaurants, a lot of companies did, and specifically the restaurant industry, and that really hit us hard. Um, and I think that we there were just so many unknown unknowns that uh, that surfaced very, very quickly. And so on top of building the relationship with a partner um, in another country, kind of responding to what we were learning real time re required a lot of focus and um, strong interpersonal <laughs> um, yeah. uh, relationship building. Yeah, no, I agree. And, um, you know, that then led to, so we kind of set a baseline, right? And we said, okay, you're reacting to potential friction points in a survey as they're happening, you're circling back, you're validating that coaching is effective, and if not, you know, you're doing additional coaching. And then once we kind of saw that kind of week over week improvement, because it moved pretty quickly, then we said, okay, now let's kind of go big picture and understand complexity, and that's something that we talk about a lot. And um, I get a lot of questions about, like, complexity. What is it? Is it a customer journey? It, it's really, you know, a hybrid of both, I would say. Um, so I'll take a minute just to walk the audience through how we think about complexity and then we, you know, we can talk specifically for Toast and kind of what value you saw it bring. But the idea of complexity analysis is twofold. The first one is, you know, what in an interaction and you're, you're analyzing data across call type and across incoming channels. So where did the, the interaction originate and then what was that interaction for, right? What did the customer want to do? And you're tracking complexity from an agent perspective. We all know that it's a stressful job to be an advisor on the phone. And so how do you make that job as consistent and as simple as possible? Because every agent wants to be successful and they want to drive resolution, right? And then, and then you look at it from a lens of a customer perspective and, and what is making the customer's process cumbersome. And a lot of times, you know, I think we found some of those areas were outside of your control, to your point. If it's a 
third party, right, that you're working with that you know is driving low resolution, um, it's just good to validate that and then go figure out how do you then root cause that differently than you would root cause internally. And then you're also able to measure kind of volatility in the process. So um, when a customer is calling for whatever that incident may be, that process should be consistent regardless of who they're talking to. If it's your captive sites, right, or if it's IBEX, you know, how do we get that consistent experience? Um, and so that's kind of what we were measuring, and, and it really kind of bubbled up. I think a lot of people always assume they know what's a friction point, right? And so I think for us, it was nice to val let, let the, the data lead us. Like, you're, you're a data person. Uh, I know that. And so, you know, let the data lead you to where you need to dig deeper. Yeah, so a couple of things I wanted to react to what you just said. First of all, one of the reasons that we partnered with IBEX is because they were, they have an expertise in, in uh, being able to get to this data-rich uh, analysis that, frankly, they're just experts in. And so that, that's been a really value-add to Toast of having those expertise and, and people like Wadad when I first met her um, and we went through some of the work that she's done, I was literally salivating because it's so exciting to see the kind of data um, information that they're bringing to the table. I think that this is why I love customer success and working within call centers. At the end of the day, especially within SaaS companies, our customers are with us longest there. And that's where we get the most data rich um, interactions, both from a qualitative and a quantitative perspective. I think what, what makes a lot of the work that we're doing difficult is kind of the category cuts, the, the traditional analytics metrics that we look at, um, CSAP by category, average handle time, they don't tell enough of the story, especially in a company like Toast, where someone might be calling, let's say, because they're seeing something strange on the reports, but really that comes from an integration from a different product. And so it just gets really uh, clunky when you're just looking at data that that only a machine can kind of produce for you. So I think part of the value that, that, that really kind of allowed the contextual um, work that you guys do and that you guys understand what really drives complexity. Um, and I have a bunch of examples here. Like we really, we're, we're constantly thinking about self-service, right? And how do we get customers, how do we teach customers to fish? And, but we can't really tell whether a configuration that happened was something because the configuration wasn't something the customer could access or we just decided to do it for them. And so having a piece of it like, was there a self-service option available in the complexity study? Something that d data just couldn't have told us um, by itself through the, the traditional cuts. And that was incredibly invaluable for our understanding our customer base. Um, and I do think that validation is important, but A, there is a lot of kind of blind spots that we all have. And B, I think that it's also really important to understand um, the, the, the size of impact, right? You, you can you can hype, sit in a room and hypothesize and whiteboard about things that you ought to do or that would make a better customer experience. But how do they stack up and how do you prioritize them is not, is not always clear. And I think that that with layering on the, the feedback from product and the, the level of effort that it takes to build some of these things makes that activity so much easier. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Um, and I think, you know, we we really just scratched the surface. I mean, when you think about it, we did kind of our first analysis. And, you know, the, uh, the beauty of it is it was hand in hand, right? I don't want to assume that I'm tracking what's valuable to you and vice versa. And so it was a constant kind of recalibration of the process throughout. Um, in case there was something we weren't missing, we needed to look at it, to your point, from a different lens, right? And so it's always this calibration between both organizations to make sure we're capturing the right data in the right places. And then, you know, it's just a baseline to your point because then you go and, and you're, you're either, to your point, validating what you knew was possibly broken or seeing areas that weren't on your radar. And then you go and you really can understand where you want to dive deeper. Um, some, I think some of it for you was, to your point, you know, these, the third party interactions and, and how do you address those compared to areas where you may have a deflection, you know, a contact deflection opportunity and how do we better articulate those to your users, right, so that they can drive their own resolution. Um, other areas were, um, you know, 
issues around high repeat contacts, right, and, and what was driving repeats in that environment. So it, it's then you, you layer on like the, the tenure piece, right, to your point, you know, how does how does that data lay out from a tenure perspective and from a channel perspective? So there are just so many different ways to slice the data. And we're really kind of just in our first or second iteration of it at this point. Yeah, I think some of the aha moments that came out of our study, are, and, and there's two things that really helps. One is because we are overlaying, to your point, your data on our data. Like, this is how complexity is by the way that we categorize our tickets or our, our or our IVR or our customer uh, cohort tenure set, we get to know what's working and what's not, right? So one of the things that you provide us is that within each cut, what is the variability of, of, of complexity? And so if we see a lot of variability in, let's say, a um, ticket category, we might say, oh, hey, this is actually seven different ticket categories, and we should get a lot more specialized on that. So we can make this repeatable without having to do the, the full kind of heavy lift of, of an ongoing process, as long as that variability stays low. I think the second thing is um, my biggest aha moment from our study was specifically on the repeat contact. So we talk about ticket deflection and reducing calls and creating self-serve options, which I think are all really, really important. But it just, I had this moment with with the SVP of customer success where we were sitting there and I was like, what if we just focus on repeat contacts? It would, it, we could improve our um, SLAs, our first call resolution. If we, if we just focused on that, we could save, we could basically cut our calls in half. And right. even if we never touched that first call. And so I think that those moments are really helped by um, the data and, and the mapping of those drivers really, really easily and, and helps you focus on, on quick wins as well as the most impactful investment areas yeah agree no agree i think it's uh it was very enlightening i think there's still a lot of work left to your point um and you know just scratching the surface uh what are your thoughts around how as well maybe to leverage the data across or, or maybe insights by contact channel is there anything interesting there for you around um around that piece yeah, so I think that contact channel, I mean, we are just starting to explore kind of the chat uh, end of our contact. Uh, right. So look, to, to wrap up, we, we work in the restaurant industry, so uh, real-time response is really, really important to our customers. So mm -hmm. oftentimes email and more kind of reaction, later reactionary channels are not a good use case for us. So right. we really want to make sure to understand. We, we knew that CSAT, for example, was already lower on our uh, chat customers, but I think the why wasn't as clear. And I think that working um, with the data that you guys provided, it made it really, really clear that the escalation process and that the feedback process of getting back to our customers was especially lacking in chat. And we utilize a chatbot um, kind of to hopefully deflect a bunch of of, um, of the early communications. And I think one of the things that you guys came to us with is saying, hey, that's not, maybe not working so well. And that kind of, and the reason is probably because we're young in, in, in the stage of, of developing our chatbot. And I think that that kind of opened up a door for us to engage in a different conversation about your IBEX's expertise in chatbot and maybe looking at our AI tool and the kind of learning mechanism and see how we can improve that together, which um, opened a door that is definitely within your wheelhouse, but uh, we wouldn't have thought to ask about because it just wasn't, we didn't realize how much it was impacting our, our, our customer deflection. And when you're getting, when you're getting an answer on a chatbot that has nothing to do with what you're saying, it's a really frustrating experience. And um, we saw, we also see ourselves as someone who works for restaurants as part of the hospitality industry. It's really important for us to make that impression really early on. So that's definitely a, a place that we want to focus on. Yeah, in the to your media. point. Oh, go ahead. Nope, that was it. <laughs> yeah, to your point, I think, you know, when you run a complexity analysis, you, you're able to assign kind of a score to each driver, right? And so not only to your, to your earlier statement, are you able to understand volatility in that process and what's kind of a deviation from kind of your norm, but you're able to very quickly identify processes that 
you may not have automated today through a bot that you could automate because you know it is one contact for resolution or it is a fairly low HT or it does not require a significant amount of probing to get to outcome and so by by being able to use kind of a gauge of what's a stable process and then what's a fairly simple process compared to others, you're able to also kind of validate to your point if your bots are being leveraged for the correct drivers as well. Yeah, there's something that I actually haven't asked you that I'm curious about, which is how different are the final, because we obviously kind of gave you guys free reign and we, the first iteration, and then we said, well, this doesn't really make sense because our the context of these calls really doesn't allow for in-call resolution or something like that. How different are the questions that you end up using for these studies across customers? They're fairly Standard. Um, I think the level of level two, level three, level four drivers within every client will differ. Um, so, for example, if you're dealing with a customer who at some point is toggling 12 to 15 CRM type tools uh, versus three or four, right, then you're, you're tracking that at different levels. But, you know, the, the, the key metrics are really going to be the same. How long is it taking you to handle that interaction? How many touches does it take from an agent perspective, right? To your our earlier point, is there a tier two element required in that? Or can it be handled by, you know, within that first call resolution and that, that one agent um, tracking, you know, the agent experience is pretty consistent as far as how many tools do they have to go through uh, the transfer piece. So the metrics are fairly the same. I think it's mostly, Yulia, how deep do you have to go within those? That varies by client. Yeah, that makes sense. I think that we are, the more people I show this tool to internally, the more um, requests I have to cut this data a certain way and to, yeah. to go deeper and about, okay, for this customer base or for this product, how do we think about what's really driving complexity? And so I think that the hard part next, the next step is kind of figuring out where to, where to focus because there's just so many ways to use um, this kind of analysis. In, in, in powerful, powerful, kind of yeah. uh, actionable. No, I agree. And I think, you know, you, we set the baseline, right? And then we go and we say, take this entire study and replicate it across a specific tenure band of yours, right? If we have this hypothesis that you have a certain amount of friction in your experience, but you have uh, three times that in the first 30 days, for example, let's validate if that's true. And are those friction points the same or not, right? And so I think tenure becomes a, a play. And then by contact channel also becomes a piece of what was the originating channel in, right? I mean, if, if they originate from a chat, that means the bot, did the bot potentially fail them, right? And they needed to chat. Or did they go directly to voice because they thought it was a complex interaction that chat couldn't handle? Or to your point, you know, did they not even go to email because the SLA was just not going to work for them? And so I think it then evolves into tenure piece, it evolves into channel, and then to your point, it evolves into product. And so really, you take this process and you continue to replicate it across all of those different places. And, you know, it's ever evolving. And then you kind of have, you have the engine in the back end, which is your call center that's that stable, real-time performance management. So you know your CSAT is not going to slip from a behavior perspective, but then you're really able to go deep, deep into program products and channels, right, to really drive that seamless experience, so. Yeah, I think that tenure for us, I mean, I, I because we have a, a obviously large product, I always talk about uh, installing toast is like doing surgery on our restaurants. <laughs> and especially since COVID hit, we're doing the surgery more and more often remotely. And so we are so concerned about those early friction points and making sure that we're helping customers really feel empowered. And there's a bunch of stuff we're doing internally. So I'm really excited about the next phase of our interaction to be on that early tenure piece, because I think that um, it's it's incredibly important for us to get that right. Yeah. So how does how does early tenure play in the COVID world? Like, I'm assuming, um, I don't know, like, are you able to have the same in-person setup and integration process in COVID that you did, you know, a year or two ago? 
Yeah, so it's, it's different in a several ways. One of them is that most of our implementation has moved to remote. So our product has gotten simpler and kind of the, the it's, it's becoming much more of a Apple-like unboxing experience with everything yeah. labeled. So it's just an easier interaction, but it's still hard. It's still not the same as plugging it in the computer and saying, okay, you're ready to go, especially because there's networking and other things involved that you need outside contractors to sometimes do. Um, but most of our, most of our uh, installs and implementations now happen remotely. That's one really big change um, that, that definitely makes the, the customer experience uh, in a lot of ways better because it's it's less cumbersome. You don't have to schedule someone. You don't have to wait for someone to let them inside. But at the end of the day, mm -hmm. it becomes more technically. And we've seen other other companies do this, right? So for, I don't know, home security systems would be something you used to have to bring someone in. And now you can kind right. of stick all the, the things around your house and you can do it. So it's similar similar to that. And as our product gets easier and easier it will, to, to manage, it will be easier on our customers. The second big thing is that we are becoming more modularized as um, it used to be that basically every customer who had Toast had to have the POS hardware software package installed. But now when uh, customers onboarded, it could mean different things. It could mean just the payroll product, or it could mean just the um, no hardware, just software online ordering and, and takeout and delivery. Um, and so customers are going through different parts of their journey earlier on. And so we really need to make sure that every kind of new experience, that first impression really feels professional and um, well suited for their needs. And then that also kind of means that they re-onboard and, and have that reintroduction to new products at different stages in their life cycle, which is com complicates the matrix even even more, which when when we're just looking at data, it just it gets really messy <laughs> very quickly yeah. and we really want to continue improving as we continue to change the product and process at the same time. Yeah, no, that makes sense. You, uh, you picked an interesting industry to be in this year.